so committee, when Senator Hooker went into the Appropriations Committee, a couple things. This is we're going to pick up S120 again and, and look at it. Uh, we never really finished the vote on it. Um, we didn't have an official document because Senator Terenzini wasn't here. So that's actually a good thing. Um, so when Senator Hooker went into appropriations, appropriations made some suggestions for changes when they took the money out. Uh, with, they made suggestions that Jen will go over for the um, consultant. And so that we'll look at that. And then I worked over the weekend in communication with uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield and the FQHCs and hospitals on the PBM language that was, is of such concern to, to so many folks. And I think that those two differing groups and sides have come to resolution on their differences and so have offered some language. How, great, <laughs> that's good. Uh, so, we'll, so we're gonna look at that as well. And then um, as we go through the bill, there was one other suggestion that came to us from Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it. So just as an overview of where we are with S120. So Jen, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. Um, so did you want me to put up the, I think we have a new draft. Yes, yes please. And also need to. And, we, and um, then after, after we look at the bill, then we can talk about uh, naming the bill as a uh, numbering the bill and whether it should be a committee bill or not. I've heard from uh, members of appropriations and uh, from the secretary's office that it might be cumbersome to put it in as a committee bill and maybe we should stick with what it is. So as S120, um, so we'll talk about that as well. Sorry, I'm gonna pull this over here. All right, can you see the document? Uh, we can see that your name and the number of the document. Okay. Does that mean you can see the whole thing or you can just no, see? No, we cannot. Uh, no, oh, we, you okay. have to click on the link. Hey, I know. It. Well, it's not working. <laughs> right today. All right. Nothing's working right today. Let's try this again. All right. Now can you see it? Yes. Excellent. Oh, good. All right, so this is the version that is done as a committee bill, but as Senator Lyons said, um, you can have that conversation about how you want it to, how you want to proceed with it. So I'll skip through. This is just the statement of purpose. I summarized the provisions of the bill. Um, so for the most part, this looks like what you looked at last week and uh, except there are these changes um, recommended by the appropriations committee or changes that they're recommending that you make um, to the task force. This is the task force on affordable, accessible health care. Um, and so the, the first thing that they either would have you do, or I think they will do if you do not, is um, take the money out. They took the money out and put it into the, um, the Senate budget. So I was reviewing that document um, Yesterday, did see the money in there. I think it should be in the H-439 um, that is on the, I think on that calendar. Um, so instead of having a specific dollar amount, um, which you'll see is struck through later, it set, would say to the extent that applicable funds are appropriated in the FY22 budget, the task force through the Office of Legislative Operations shall hire a consultant. And then instead of saying to coordinate the task force's work, it would say to provide technical and research assistance, deliver actuarial analyses as needed and support the work of the task force. And then the task force would continue to have uh, the support of or assistance of the legislative offices. So the, the language that they've put in there is consistent with the language that's crossed out at the bottom of page seven. Largely, so there was this um, kind of duplicative language in here um, the, here's where the actual appropriation was. So this would come out, this whole subsection would come out. 
um, because we've said, you know, to the extent the funds are appropriated and the funds are being appropriated in the big bill. Um, the language here had been the consultant coordinating the activities, which is the language you saw struck through in E, and to cover related costs of actuarial analyses, research, me meetings, and the per diem compensation and reimbursement for members of the task force. The per diems are already included in this existing subsection H, which takes the money out of the um, funds appropriated to the General Assembly. So it wasn't necessary to have those the per diem money also come out of this 175. So that was just a little um, you know, drafting mishap. Um, but so what would the language that would survive then would be here under assistance um, and that would have this consultant providing the technical and research assistance uh, delivering actuarial analyses as needed and supporting in the work of the task force. You're frozen. Uh oh. Rather uh -oh. than just coordinating Jen. with funds being available. Yes. No, you're good. You're 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 freezing a little bit. You're going in and out. Maybe, maybe uh, take your video off while we're going through it. I think there's too much going on. Try it. Let me find my video. Uh oh, <laughs> it's good now. I, you know, maybe it okay. was just something. Oh. Yeah, I'm have been having some internet issues today. Apparently, my internet is unstable, but maybe it's back. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so again, I was just trying to highlight the differences here. Um, instead of this language, this broader language about coordinating the task force's work, it has this consultant actually providing the technical and research assistance, delivering the actuarial analyses as needed and supporting the work of the task force. And the earlier version with the appropriation language at the end here in subsection I, the consultant was doing the coordination, but this money was also to be used to cover related costs of things like research um, meetings and otherwise. So that is what they are suggesting you include. Um, and the other reason that, that we're looking back at this language again is because of that section toward the end of the bill that you had passed out, which I've now struck, but just put a little note in um, to remind us, which was the DFR benchmark plan review. They moved all of that language into the budget and so they were asked that you delete that from your bill and have it ride in the budget. So, and just FYI for everyone, I mean, obviously we, we knew that this would probably happen or could happen. Um, and then I also received a note from Diva asking that we put the primary care study into the benchmark plan and it came in a little late and now the benchmark plan is in the budget, so it's not something we can add here. So maybe the house or we can, I'll get that message to appropriations to perhaps add primary care visits, cost sharing into the benchmark plan if the committee thinks that would be helpful. I, I, I think it'd be great actually, but. So, uh, I, and I think that would need to, or would likely be specific to the individual and small group market yes. piece. You'd still probably want subsection B, which is the Green Mountain Care Board and others looking at the impact on the large group, including state employees and school employees. Yeah, so, and I, I guess given where we are right now, we'll leave it there for now. And then if changes can be made during the uh, H439 process or the process that this bill goes through going forward, we can maybe that'll get shifted over. Just wanted the heads up on that one. So section A, you're saying Jen is the one that would go, yeah, okay. I think it's, uh, right, I think it would be this subsection A that is specific to the individual and small group plans or really looking at the qualified health plans, um, which is the focus of the benchmark plan review. So there's the linkage there. Okay. All right. All righty. Did you want to go then to the, I have not made any changes in parts so that you can have the conversation on the PBMs, but also 
do you have a copy of the language I sent? I sent you the copy. Can you put that up from from the FQHC and a big Blue Cross Blue Shield dialogue? And you're you're not coming through right now. Jen's gone. Madam Chair, maybe we should have Jen not share her screen because that's probably yeah, we're going to you're going to do something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Jen. Jen. She can't hear me. She's trying to get back here. It's like being in a dark in a black hole out in the universe somewhere. Okay. Jen Carby. I, I, yes. Can you see, can you see and hear me? I switched networks. now. We can. You froze up. I know. I, I tried. To, I've been having internet issues today, and I tried changing networks, and I think it worked, but it booted me off. So I have to come back. <laughs> okay. So uh, I don't know where where we got uh, separated. I could out. still hear you. You just couldn't uh, hear me. Um, okay. So I have it by email. I mean, I have that language and just in an email, so I can put it up. Okay. If you, if you want, just out of my, out of the email document. Um. Basically, what it does is it it takes away one, the first part of the PBM language, and then it keeps this. I think it's the second part. I'm trying to remember each part. Right. It, yes. So it gets rid of of D one and leaves D two and three. So we renumber those. Um, well, it puts and it, so it keeps a study in. That's and then it adds a study. Adds a study. So the study is new, um, and I actually have a question about the study language. I'm just copying and pasting this into a okay so we standalone document so it doesn't have people's names on it and such. Okay, can you see that language? Yes, we can. Great. So as you can see here, um, the proposal is to, um, you, you don't see what is subdivision D1 in the version that we have been looking at, and it keeps the language of the other two provisions, D1 and D2. So the P, a PBM shall not require a claim for a drug to include a modifier to indicate that the drug is a 340B drug unless the claim is for payment directly or indirectly by Medicaid or restrict access to a pharmacy network or adjust reimbursement rates based on a pharmacy's participation in a 340B contract pharmacy arrangement. So it, it gets rid of that broader language uh, that was sort of generally about not creating additional requirements or restrictions on a 340B entity on the basis of its participation in the 340B drug discount program. So it's high, drug much more program. specific. It, it goes right to the specific. Right. Yep. Um, and then it, it would require, and I would do this a little differently, I wouldn't codify this one-time requirement or effective date, um, but it would have DFR and the Attorney General's Office report to the legislature on January 15, 2022 on possible state approaches to the developing issue of pharmaceutical manufacturers ceasing to pay rebates to commercially insured Vermonters, this is the piece I had the question on because I'm not sure that they're paying rebates to commercially insured Vermonters personally for no, drugs dispensed by a 340B pharmacy. Any update to federal health and human services policy in this area and the financial impact to commercially insured Vermonters and 340B pharmacies of these changes. So I think we need a little bit more, I, I at least need a little bit more clarity on what this, the issue that they're citing of the manufacturers ceasing to pay rebates. It sounds like they're trying to say uh, pay rebates for um, prescriptions uh, available or paid for. Well, I mean, the drugs that are dispensed by a 340B pharmacy, the, yeah. the rebates or the, or the drug pricing it is realized, I think, by the pharmacy, which is affiliated with this 340B covered entity. I think the people who are working, who, who proposed the language are much more in the weeds on the 340B program than I am. Um, so I'm sure they know what they're talking about. I just need to make sure that we're aligned in what we're understanding. So um, I'll leave that to you. 
And then I'm also not sure this per, these provisions shall take effect immediately and expire on December 31st, 2022, unless otherwise modified or extended. I'm not sure if this is a temporary provision, um, then I may I may change the way it's done altogether. We may just put it in session law. I don't. So I need to understand more. Just having the language by itself is not. Um, it is not providing me with the full picture of what they're looking for. There was a, um, oh, let me just, I got another email late last night that <clears throat> talked about the date of July 1st. Um, Madam Chair, yeah. can I ask you a question? Who? Who developed this language? Because this seems like it does a different thing than what the original language did. <laughs> it, well, it, it does. It does. It takes out the first very broad statement. This comes from a dialogue between Vaz, F the by state primary care and Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So it was sort of the please go out into the hallway and come up with something that is less uh, controversial on so that this is a compromise this is compromised language from those folks and um so that's it so madam chair yeah can jen just um clarify what this is going to do I mean, as far as the pharmacists are concerned, the pharmacies and the drug prices for Vermonters, this isn't, I mean, when it says um, ceasing to pay rebates to commercially insured Vermonters, I, mean, I know that you said you needed to be clear on that. And so I need to be clear on it as well. We'll get, we, yes, we'll, we need to get clarity on that. You're absolutely right, Senator. But the benefit of the 340B program is to have some access to prescription drugs at prices that are less than um, other places. Mm -hmm. So the the goal here is to main is to make sure that that continues. The first right. section that was taken out would have been not allowed any uh, action on the part of PBMs, and this restricts what PBMs can do to in a narrower way to access some of the savings. And that's really what it's about. Okay. Jen, do you want to um, to the can you, Jen, provide a um, a thumbnail sketch of what is happening through the PBMs right now and why Utah, for example, and why Ohio, why they're passing the bills that they're passing. I, I don't actually have that okay. information. I mean, we, right. we didn't hear testimony on, I don't believe on what problem the language is looking to solve. So I'm not able to articulate well, that. Well, yeah, we did hear from the hospitals and we heard from Bry State Primary Care, but their concerns were, um, moderated by concerns from Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So the language here simply allows for, um, the, for us to make sure that the savings are provided to the 340B pharmacies and to patients rather than to the PBMs. And I think that's really what we're, what we're getting at. Part of the 340B program for our FQHCs and other pharmacies is to ensure that there are some savings within the pharmaceutical pricing process and that those savings go to the pharmacies or to the facilities that are 340B certified. And if you take all the savings away from them, then there can not possibly be a benefit to either the pharmacy, the 340B facility, or to the patient. That's it. Okay. 
Senator Hardy. Thanks, Madam Chair. I guess I'm, I'm feeling a little un uncomfortable with this because it seems to me, and I don't have the language that Jen just put up. D and let, did you send it to us, Jen, or is it? I, I did not. It came from an email that the chair had sent to me that I okay. got late yet last night. So now that the language is up, um, can you send that? Nelly, you also have the language. Can you extract the language and post it on our web page? It doesn't seem to be trying to solve the same problem that the other language was trying to solve, or at least it, it seems incongruous with it based. And I'm a little, we didn't get that much testimony. We got the testimony sort of in, as in passing within larger things. So I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I'm concerned I'm, that if we don't say something about this and have an analysis going forward, that all the pharmaceutical savings that, are, that go to 340B facilities, including pharmacies and patients will be, will be under, under duress. I, I understand that. I mean, I, I would certainly be concerned about that too, but I, it doesn't, the language that was originally proposed by- It was much broader. You're but right. It, it seems to be more about administrative stuff and and that the benefit managers are requiring all of these sort of administrative hoops to jump through for par programs participating in this and that they were trying to get rid of those administrative hoops. And now the language, although I don't have it in front of me, seems to be more about, I, I don't know, payments maybe. <laughs> um, so, Well, um, so if you look at what's on page nine of the bill, as we have it before us. So create additional requirements or restrictions on 340B entity. Um, so it's that could be a pricing or it could be rebates. I don't know what it is. I don't know what that, that it could be very, it is very broad. Okay, so that, so with that out, then Nellie, is that language up yet? Jen, can you put that language back up that we're looking at? Sure. So, you know, number three on page nine talks about restrict access to pharmacy network or adjust reimbursement rates. So that, that's a problem. Okay, so Jen, can you walk us through this uh, one more time slowly so we fully understand what's here? Sure. It says a pharmacy benefit manager shall not require a claim for a drug to include a modifier to indicate that the drug is a 340B drug unless the claim is for payment directly or indirectly by Medicaid or do you want me to stop there? What does what does it mean to include a modifier to indicate? It, is it just it's, it's like part of how they bill? It's so in, in addition to it, it's something that indicates um, some sort of coding uh, indicator that it's a 340B drug. So it's flagged as being a 340B drug. Okay. And so I, I think the impact of this would be so that that the um, PBM or insure well PBM in this case um, would be paying claims for um, drugs without knowledge of whether they are 340B drugs or not. So without without reference to whether the the uh, pharmacy acquired them at a reduced cost because they were participating in the 340B drug pricing program. Okay. Um, except for Medicaid, that information is necessary um, and would continue to be included. And uh, PBM also could not restrict access to a pharmacy network or adjust reimbursement rates based on a pharmacy's participation in a 340B contract pharmacy arrangement. So again, here, I think they're looking at getting the regular reimbursement amount and not some reduced amount based on 340B participation. 
What is restrict access to a pharmacy network? What do you know what that would mean? I don't. I don't think I can okay. answer that one. <laughs> So Madam and then Clark, we would have, yes, do you want me to go into the report stuff or do you want, do you want to discuss I, these two? No, I'm, I'm trying to get um, some of the advocates in who were uh, working on this language right. and invite them in. So I've asked Nellie to invite them in to the committee right now so we can have a, a broader discussion. So, so the, uh, so going back uh, restrict access to a pharmacy network, which it would seem to me um, that a pharmacy benefit manager uh, can't move someone from, from one pharmacy to another. So if the pharmacy is a 340B pharmacy and it might provide lower cost drugs, the PBM may be getting a, a rebate or some benefit from another pharmacy. I don't know exactly how that would work, but that could be what is being uh, restricted here, not allowing for the pharmacy benefit manager to direct the patient to a specific pharmacy, not a 340B pharmacy. So there's benefit to the patient to be at their 340B pharmacy. A PBM may be, get, may be able to get some benefit from having that patient go to another pharmacy. That's kind of, that's what I'm reading there, but let's hope that we can get some of these folks in to help us further. So let's go to the report. Okay, the report piece is that the Department of Financial Regulation and the Attorney General's Office would report to the General Assembly on January 15th, 2022 on possible state approaches to the developing issue of pharmaceutical manufacturers ceasing to pay rebates to commercially insured Vermonters for drugs dispensed by 340B Pharmacy. Any update to federal health and human services, I think that's the US Department of Health and Human Services policy in this area, and the financial impact to commercially insured Vermonters and 340B pharmacies of these changes. Okay. So, okay. Is there any question about that one? Yeah, Jen, why would the AG's office be? What, what's their jurisdiction here? I don't Besides know. Legally, legal people. I don't know. Again, <laughs> not my language, so I don't, yeah. I don't know. What I know. The, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I don't. I don't know what the I intent will say, was here, except uh, perhaps if they're concerned about anti-competitive behavior or or something like that. But I don't probably. Know. And the the AG's office has been very much engaged in looking at drug pricing and gets a report uh, regularly about uh, increased um, cost of drugs, especially for special specialized drugs. There's a limited amount that we can do in terms of drug, drug cost, prescription drug costs, but it's the AG's office has been very much engaged in that over time. Um, so that's, I guess, why that one is in there. That was my thought when I read it. So well, here's what, so now let's, um, No, the, the, I know that, the, the, um, but a PBM may see a rebate, not the individual patient. Patients don't see the rebate. Um, so let's move, let's take that one off. And here's my suggestion. I'm going to invite the people in who work together on this and, <laughs> keep getting my little messages. Um, patients have no clue what the price, what the price differential is, whether that it, it's based on a PBM and insurance or a 340B, anything. That, that's not, the patient doesn't see that. The patient simply sees the copay or the cost overall. 
So this is about the internal functionings of the 340B facility and the um, insurance company and the PBM. So what I'm going to suggest is that we invite um, Helen Laban, Devin Green, and Sarah teach out into our committee tomorrow because we have some time tomorrow. I, I have deliberately. Helen Laban's coming in soon. So let's um, let me see what that message is. Hang on. So we'll we'll hold here and whoever can come in to help us this morning, that'll be great. And then if we can't get to closure on this today, we'll take a little bit of time tomorrow and look at it so we can finish our work on H120. I mean, S120, apologize okay. for that. So, Senator, Senator Lyons, Lyons, thank you, Senator Lyons. So um, can we just ask those advocates who are coming in to clarify who this is helping and yeah, what definitely. it's going to do? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. That'll, that, that's the primary question, you know, yeah. we wanna make sure. The problem with this one is the 340B program is meant to to help uh, patient access to prescription drugs at a lower price and uh, through the awesome. through the three four, federal 340B program, but there may be some loopholes that allow for the money to go different places and PBMs are passing through. Too. Yeah, so I, you know, it's it it gets to be more and more complicated the further along you go, and then you start talking about how do we price prescription drugs and on from there and we haven't looked at that or at least some some of us haven't uh, the committee hasn't seen that recently so we may want to pick that one up at some point so uh, madam chair I, are we doing tomorrow the the joint session that's thursday during... that's... oh it's thursday oh I, I had in my mind that it was tomorrow with judiciary no, thursday thursday I, okay. I, I deliberately put a day between today and that one, just so we could do anything we needed to on the bills that went to appropriations. And um, so Thursday, while we're discussing it, is a joint meeting with the Judiciary Committee on a bill H-225 on the on buprenor low uh, quantities of buprenorphine. Uh, and so we'll, I've been working with uh, getting testimony for that and Senator Sears has been working getting testimony for that so we'll have that day together uh, but for this one it, Jen I think there's another section that we should look at and that is a, 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 a an ask from um, the insurance companies actually from Sarah, Sarah Teachout from Blue Cross and Blue Shield about the administrative expenses report indicating that it isn't it's an unnecessary request so when, when she comes in we'll ask her to um, go through that with us as well i just just this morning received an email from her about that so committee let's take a break until 11 o'clock and uh, we'll see if Helen Laban joins us or if Devin Green or Sarah Teachout uh, join us. And then we'll pick up at 11 where we are right now. Okay. Next.